Well, hi, and welcome to another update on my Bear Hawk aircraft. So I've finished uh, putting it together and we've actually done uh, several flights on it now. And it's all going very, very well. So when I left off the last video, we had trucked the fuselage down here to Ashburton Airfield at the, uh, in the South Island of New Zealand. We then trucked the wings down, uh, assembled it with the help of um, some friends and uh, spent the next couple of weeks um, just connecting all the parts, the cables, checking everything out and then we spent an entire week of doing tests on it. So we had to test the fuel flow, do a weight and balance. It went through a 100 hour check and annual inspection and uh, once everything was complete and all the paperwork was ready, all the log books were, were done and up to date, I was then able to apply to the Civil Aviation Authority and they sent the inspector down and he spent half a day going through everything on the Bearhawk and very happy to say that it passed with flying colours so then we spent uh, another day putting it all back together and the test flight occurred last Thursday late in the afternoon to very little fanfare actually. It was just myself and the local engineer to give me a hand and uh, that went well. So um, I've now got nine hours on it and today is a stunning day after several days of rain. So let's go flying. So my first flight was really exhilarating and um, just so much fun at the end of the Bearhawk build to actually get out there and as I mentioned I didn't um, pass the word around friends or anything, I, I really didn't want that, I just wanted to go out by myself so I had the local engineer there to check everything over for me and um, the flight went really well. I cut it short at 15 minutes and that was because the cylinder head temps on the uh, reconditioned engine were getting uh, quite hot or so I thought, it actually turned out I had the red line set a, a wee bit low. So. Um, Anyway, the uh, the landing was really good. It seemed to handle quite well, but it did highlight a couple of areas, as you would expect, that needed to be addressed. The first area that became really apparent on my very first takeoff was I had a lack of rudder control on the right rudder, and that caught me by surprise. I thought it was due to uh, engine torque, prop factor, that kind of thing, precession. Um, however, it was still there on the next flight when I was more aware of it and so what we did is we propped the tail of the aircraft up on a trestle and I climbed up in the cockpit and discovered that one of the springs holding the rudder pedals in place was bunching up behind the rudder pedal. So we removed the springs, replaced them with some much lighter ones. And so in addition to changing the rudder springs I also added a uh, rudder trim tab and that was because I was having to hold a lot of right rudder in, uh, at all air speeds and I did check out all air speeds and uh, yeah so definitely uh, the trim tab helped uh, immediately. We did a couple of flights where we just ad adjusted it and fine tuned it and I probably need to um, keep fine tuning it until I get it spot on but it's, it's uh, much improved now and uh, it's, it simply makes the yaw control much much easier. Now the next thing that became apparent was when I was flying along straight and level and I uh, let go of the control stick for a minute or so, I, I looked out the window and I could see straight away that the right hand aileron was reflexed a lot more than the left hand aileron. Now I had followed the instructions and reflexed both of them about three eighths of an inch above the wingtip. But even so, the right one was reflexed about double that and the left one was staying neutral with the joystick offset towards the right. So that had us scratching our heads for a wee bit. What I did then was uh, after a couple of flights and seeing that uh, behavior repeat itself, we went back and decided to check all of the rigging throughout the whole aircraft. That started off with checking that the tires were inflated to the same amount. Immediately we noticed that uh, the right wing was slightly low on the ground. So um, what we did then, took the uh, engine carling off, hoisted the nose of the aircraft up by the engine mounts and corrected the oleo struts. So once we got that sitting level with the correct track distance, um, then the wings were level. Check that with uh, an inclinometer and then we proceeded to check the flaps first. It became apparent there was a very small um, adjustment needed on each flap but the, uh, the amount they were out was in the direction that would account for the aileron um, reflex on the right wing. So I simply used the wooden profile that came with a kit set and uh, we did a little bit of re-rigging there, did another test flight and yeah straight away, hey presto, the, um, the ailerons were much more evenly balanced. The, the right aileron currently is slightly higher than the left one in level flight but it's quite difficult to detect visually and I can live with that. 
So during these flights, of course, I was running the engine, and my, my engine is uh, a Bob engine, and uh, it's got um, fuel injection on it. I've added PMAGs, and uh, yeah, it seems to be very, very good, but um, of course, I've never run an engine in before, so that was, there was a, a huge learning curve there. One of the uh, things that you discover straight away is you do run at a very high power setting, so, and consequently, you're going quite fast everywhere. Uh, it turned out in my bear hawk about 135 knots or even more. So um, I was, you know, trying to do some longer flights, uh, perhaps a couple of hours in between landing, and of course your fuel burn is quite high. I was getting through about 82 litres an hour initially. So um, one of the one of the first things I had to do was raise the red line limits. I had to research those again in the Lycoming manual. I had set them up probably for normal operations rather than running the engine in. And after about an hour and a half to two hours, there was quite a perceptible decrease in the cylinder head temperatures. Also a small increase in the uh, speed of the aircraft um, straight and level. So that seems to have been going quite well. We, we did an initial oil change and uh, got the engineer to look over the results there. We pulled the rock catcher and also the suction screen, checked them. There was a small amount of de debris in the uh, suction screen from reconditioning the engine. And uh, as you'd expect, um, a few sparklers in the uh, oil filter as well. We've now done a second uh, oil change. I'm now up to about 17 and a half hours, I think, on the, on the aircraft. We've done a second oil change and been through and checked everything there. So that all seems to be going okay at this stage. So one of the things I did uh, quite early on after uh, two or three hours was I took the aircraft up to a safe altitude and did some stalls. It was just, you know, preliminary stalls just to uh, firstly help get my own hand back in and satisfy myself that the approach speeds I was flying um, were sufficient. So I did a number of stalls. I did two sessions of them with the aircraft lightly loaded and pretty much on the Ford CFG limit. Um, all of them went okay. I managed to drop the wing uh, twice, so I will go back and have another look at that. I've captured the data, but uh, really didn't do it justice, I don't think. So I'm going to do a whole bunch more stalls at various weights in various uh, CFG areas as well. So I've been uh, trying a few different takeoff techniques. It's very early days yet, and I don't have a lot of tailwheel time. So initially, my inclination was to uh, depart by bringing the aircraft up onto the main wheels lifting the tail off the ground and then just letting it fly off. And that seems to work quite well. I've done that both uh, flaps retracted and with up to two stages of flap and no problems there at all. I discovered also um, very early on that it flies off the three point attitude very easily. And if you just let it do that, you tend to get quite a short takeoff without even trying. That then led me into uh, trying a few different landing techniques and the first thing I discovered is that I really have to concentrate on, on slowing the aircraft down in the landing pattern and that is basically late downwind I'm, I'm trying to get the aircraft back to about 80 knots or below the uh, first notch flap limit speed. That tends to work um, far better. In my first few approaches, I was flying far too fast. So um, once I got the hang of that, I'm uh, on most approaches taking two notches of flap late downwind, turning base, and then on finals taking a third notch of flap. A lot, a lot of the landings just seem quite easy with three notches of flap. I've done some with two notches of flap. And with three notches, it seem, seems to work quite well. Your limit speed for the third notch is uh, 65 knots, which means that I can fly final approach at 55 with a safe margin and everything works out quite well. I've done a few approaches with uh, all four notches of flap, so full flap. That um, you, you do have to be a little bit more careful, or certainly I found that I do. It's very easy to develop a high rate of sync on short finals. And uh, I discovered almost straight away that you're far better off approaching with uh, some engine power with, with the aircraft powered up and that uh, removes any um, requirement for a, a large flare at the end and uh, it, which would be needed if you had to arrest a high rate of descent. So by setting it up at say 50 knots and full flap on um, medium finals and then just flying it in a, as a powered approach, certainly at my early stage of learning, it's, it seems to be working quite well and it still results in a very short landing. I've yet to try uh, wheelers um, properly. I've done a couple and uh, probably my technique is not that good at this stage. So I, that's one of the things I'm gonna practice uh, in, the, in the next few flights. 
So I should say also that my intention is to fit Vortex generators onto the wing. I've, I've purchased them already, they're sitting there in the hangar waiting, but I do want to uh, get some good data on the uh, Bravo model wing before I put the Vortex generators on. So uh, up until now I've explored the Ford uh, CFG limit area of the envelope um, in quite a lot of detail because that's what you start off doing first. Um, my first few flights were very lightly loaded with just my cell phone which put me right on the Ford CFG limit. So just to um, for, for those of you that have your own bear hawks and, and are building them and have looked at the, the uh, CFG envelope, uh, the Ford limit is 10.5 inches or thereabouts back from the leading edge and up to the aft CFG limit which is around 22 and a half uh, inches from the leading edge, give or take a little bit. Now when I did my weight and balance, my empty aircraft actually came in at 8.3 inches. So to get it back far enough to the Ford limit that I can actually fly it, it needs my weight in the front seat and about 20 litres of fuel. And that's really good because it's an extremely usable uh, envelope. What it means is that I can come back after a long flight with just myself on it, right on the forward uh, limit of the centre of gravity and minimum reserves fuel of say 20, 22 litres, something like that, and still land safely. And in fact, I, I have uh, played around quite a lot with a weight and balance app. I'm using two different apps just to compare data and make sure that there's um, no errors in there. And so far it looks like I'm going to be able to load my aircraft right up to 2,500 pounds, um, probably even higher because the actual takeoff weight limit is 2,700 pounds. I don't think I need that extra 200 pounds, but useful to have you know, just a bit of, bit of fat in the system for mum and the kids. Um, I, I plan to use it up to 2,500 pounds and I think I will max that out before I hit the aft CFG limit. In fact, from what I've seen on the, uh, on the apps, it's very, very hard for me to get to that aft CFG limit. I, I need a lot of weight in the baggage uh, area, in the cargo area to do that. Now I did strike quite an interesting issue during the initial test flying at the Ford CFG limit and that was that I was running out of back trim on the elevators and this, this became uh, apparent on final approach, particularly uh, with a couple of stages of flap. I was having to hold the uh, joystick hard back with quite a lot of pressure and I was unable to trim it in that position. So actually what I did eventually is I detached the trim push rods from under the tailplane, put a small extra bend in them using a pipe bender uh, that gave me more threaded adjustment on the rod end bearings. I refitted those and um, that worked quite well. Now, subsequently what happened was when I then loaded some sandbags in and moved the centre of gravity rearwards, I discovered that the uh, trim wheel was turning by itself and that gave me quite a fright actually because what, what happened was I'd be flying along shortly after takeoff, go to trim some nose up elevator because of the uh, rearward CFG, take my hand off the trim wheel and unbeknown to me it was moving back to the original position but what, what I sensed happening was that I was continually trimming higher and higher and not getting any response so I, I returned and landed straight away before we realised what was actually happening. So to fix that we uh, it turned out we'd um, only set 45 pounds tension on the uh, on the trim cables they're spec to be at 60 pounds tension and I had run out of um, adjustment on them so we ended up uh, removing a cable remaking one and fitting it and sitting at 260 pounds tension and that solved the problem straight away. I do have to say that I'm not a huge fan of the pitch trim system um, I, I, I really was unsure during the build process how that was going to work out. The fact that it's servoed, it, it is a difficult one because you need a full range of trim because of the speed range on the Bearhawk. And to get that full range of trim, I can understand why it was designed with the servoed tab. But there are a couple of side effects with the, with the servoed trim tab. And uh, one is that you, you can end up um, at higher speeds, at around 130 knots. That trim wheel is super sensitive and it's given me a, quite a fright on more than one occasion. The flip side to that is that approach speeds, when you've got the speed back, say 50, 60, 70 knots, it loses its sensitivity. So there's no easy fix there. So as of currently, I, I've got the aircraft uh, flying very, very well. I'm very happy with the rigging on it. It's um, just a beautiful machine to fly. I'm getting much better at the takeoffs and landings. I, I still need a lot more practice on the takeoffs and landings. And uh, over the next few days, I plan to explore the stall envelope much, much uh, in much more detail. And I'll record it all um, with the purpose of refining my approach speeds. At the moment, I'm flying fairly conservative approaches. Uh, but I do think the wing's capable of a lot more. 
I plan uh, to add Vortex generators probably next week and then I'll go and redo all the stools and uh, come up with new approach speeds and once again ex explore the envelope with that. Um, also in the upcoming days I will be flying at a RCFG and taking that back to the RF limit of 22.5 inches and also at max all up weight um, of 2,500 pounds as, as I mentioned I'll be using uh, that lower landing weight limit um, for most of my operations. So overall it's going very well and uh, time I finish this video because there's only so much footage you can watch of one guy flying around having fun and I do apologise for that. But um, there you go, um, very very happy with it and I'll post uh, another video in due course once I've got more to report. Thanks very much.